recording here and we're going to get into building a successful team today and I am so pumped about this. This is uh, probably some of the best value you're going to get from this um, series with Jim Rohn. And so hold on one second and I will get this going for us. Topic under leadership, how to build a successful team of people. Finding the right people is always a unique challenge. And this is how to build a successful team of people to accomplish a specific purpose. Now, if you don't have a specific purpose, then you can probably just use most anybody. But if you've got a, a purpose, you know, whether it's a sales purpose or an office purpose or a real estate purpose or a church purpose or a organization purpose or a championship team, right? If you're going to build an organization of people for a specific accomplishment, then you've got to have uh, the right people. And let me just give you a little checklist we use around the world trying to find the right people. First, there's a checklist of three things. First, you check interest. And checking a person's interest uh, there's probably several ways you can do it. One is, I guess, by resume. What someone has done in the past may indicate their interest for the future. But I, the best way really to check interest is face to face. You know, you just got to look at somebody and have them look back and get into conversation. And talk about the enterprise and talk about, you know, the job description, you know, what it's all about to find a person's true interest. Now, in the role of leadership, you do have to be cautioned that some people are going to try to fake you out. So you've got to get ready for that. But um, if you do it often enough, person to person, face to face, you can get good at really checking a person's true interest. I guess Jesus' master teacher was the best at it. The story says one day a group came to him and said, uh, Master, we wish to be your disciples. Jesus said, Gentlemen, you have put your story on the wrong person. Because unfortunately, I can read your heart. They said, Oh. <laughs> See, they weren't wanting to be disciples. They had, all, they had all kinds of trickery in mind. But that was the upfront show of interest. We wish to be your disciples. But see, he read them just right off the bat. Now, you might not get that good at it, <laughs> right, to where you can read hearts. But I'll tell you what, though. If you will practice, if you'll be sensitive, if you'll look, if you won't miss anything, you can get very good at reading true interest to really check that against what you hear in the conversation that's going on. Now, of course, here's where the woman comes in with her extra special gifts, right? See, if a man's having problems recruiting someone or, or talking to another man and he's not quite sure, then he just lets a woman sit in on the conversation and says, You just sit and listen while I talk to this gentleman, and then you'd give me your feelings and sure enough you know she'll tell you you know when it's over you just consult with her say how'd you feel she'll say hey i felt great or she will say i don't think so right because the women have this uncanny sense of danger or something doesn't ring a bell but, uh, you know, men can get good at it. But anybody who practices this art of really trying to judge true interest can get better and better at it. Now, no matter how good you get, you're still going to make some errors in judgment. Jesus said, I'll take you. And that was Judas. I mean, so you are going to make, you know, some <laughs> errors. So that helps me, right, to know when I make some errors. 
Now, so first of all, you check interest. Here's the second thing you check is response. A person might be interested in the pay or they might be interested in uh, you know, the opportunity or the future, but you also have to check response. How they respond to the job description. Are they excited and eager about whatever it takes to do it to get the job done? If somebody says, you have to get there how early? <laughs> You have to stay how late? Go home in the middle of the traffic? The brakes only, what was that again? 10 minutes? You just have to say next, right? You, you just don't have the right person because the response is wrong. Then third, third thing you check to build a successful team of people is results. And I don't know any substitute for that. Finally, you must judge by results. Results must soon match quality. You might have a nice person, a good person, but unless you start getting early results, then you just don't have the right person. And it isn't that the wrong person may be a bad person, it's just that they are not the right person for the job, for the skill or whatever needs to be accomplished. You know, the great coach John Wooden, I'm sure said to the supposedly skilled young basketball player, he says, sir, can you hit it from the corner? I got to have me a corner man who can hit it from the corner. And uh, well, how are we gonna know if you can hit it from the corner? Right? John says, well, I'll just stand here, and you just fire away, and I'll count. <laughs> That's how you finally tell. Just launch a few, and I'll just, I'll just keep score here, because I got to have somebody who can hit it from the corner. And the early part of activity doesn't need to be the final results. The results can be, did you make the calls? This job calls for at least 10 calls a day. So the next morning, we get the little sheet out, and I say, John, how many calls on that 10 did you make yesterday? John says, well, say, the well won't even fit in the box. <laughs> and sure enough, I've got this indication, John's gonna come up with a story, and the story for sure won't fit in the box. I say, John, the box is too small for the story. All I need is a number. One, three, five, eight, seven. Just give me the number and I'll put it in the box. See, finally, you must judge by results. Because that's the name of the game, right? Results. Now, we all need to give people time for results, but finally, you must judge by results. We don't judge by stories. We just let the numbers speak for themselves. We let the activity that we've set up. Now make sure when you recruit somebody, put somebody on and you're developing an organization, whatever you're doing, make sure everybody understands up front what the requirements are. So that now when you get to check the requirements, there was no misunderstanding at first as to what was required for the job or the activity and to get it done, okay? But finally, you must judge by results. The Bible's full of all those illustrations, right? And stories about human life and human behavior and activity and what to expect and what's going on. Incredibly rich. There was one story said Jesus and his disciples were walking along this road, I guess after a hard day's work. They're heading home. And one of the disciples said, there's a fig tree. Let's go over, have some figs, relax a little bit, and then continue our journey. And evidently the master thought it was a good idea. So the story says they all went off the side of the road to this fig tree. And it must have been the season of the figs, right? Or they wouldn't have said, let's go have some figs. So they walk over to this fig tree, and they look all around it inside and out, check it all out, and to their very great disappointment on this fig tree, in the season of the figs, there were no figs. On a fig tree. Very quickly, according to the story, Jesus said, take this tree out. That's what he said. A fig tree is supposed to have figs. Take this one out. <laughs> now, something interesting happened though. 
Something interesting happened. The story says, one of them said, Master, look, let's make a deal. Right? And God's always been in the deal-making business. Really. In reading the whole, the whole Bible. And sometimes it's kind of a game that's played. It says God and Satan got together one day. And uh, Satan said, I got a deal for you. You got this guy, Job, he's a favorite of yours. But if you'll let me at him, I'll make him curse you before he dies. God said, no way. He's my special favorite. He would never curse me. Satan said, try me. God says, hmm. interesting proposition. Now, poor Job doesn't know this conversation is going on. <laughs> ah, who knows what all's going on, right? I don't know what all's going on. But God thought that over and said, hey, wait just a minute. I'll tell you what, Satan. I'll let you at him, but the only thing you can't do, because it's true, I've protected him up until now. And Satan said, yeah, you got a wall around him. I can't even get to him. But if you take the wall down, I guarantee you he'll curse you. God said, no way. He said, try me. God says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll let you do anything but kill me. Satan said, that's all I need. <laughs> they make this deal. And now, sure enough, Satan goes after Job, according to the story. Takes his family, takes all of his possessions, afflicts him with sickness and boils, ruins his reputation. <laughs> and now he's sitting on an ash heap, scraping his sores. His wife says, why don't you curse God and die? He said, get away from me, woman. <laughs> he said, the good Lord gave me all this, and whatever he gives, he can take away. God's up there smiling. <laughs> and he never did curse God. So Satan had to come back and say, you got you quite a man. I did my best. I, I told you. Now God says, well, I've played this game now with Job. What can I do to make it up to him? Because if you play games with your friends, you've got to make it up to him. So God says, well, I got to think of something. So he says, I know what I'll do. I'll just multiply by seven whatever he had to begin with. Which is probably what you should do if you play those kind of games. <laughs> <laughs> multiply at least by seven. So who knows what all is going on? But uh, the Bible is rich in so many incredible stories. But this one, you know, the master teacher said, take the fig tree out. But the disciples said, one of them said, look, we come by this way all the time. Give us a chance with this tree. We'll dig around and see if we can work with it. And the next time we come by here, the next season, then we'll have some figs. Jesus said, you got to do it. So evidently, they worked with this tree. And sure enough, the story flashes back and says, they came along that road the next season for the second time. One of them said, there's our tree. Let's go have some figs. And for the second season in a row, they went over, checked out this fig tree. And sure enough, to their great disappointment, for the second season in a row, no figs. Without hesitation, Jesus this time said, take this tree out. And he added, why let it take up the ground? And I guess that means big trees better have figs. So you just have those meetings every once in a while. You call everybody together and say, today we check in the figs. <laughs> <laughs> to see who gets to stay. I don't know what else you do. Finally, you got to check by results. You judge by results in the final analysis. Okay. Now, here's another key to leadership. In building a successful team of people, learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Key point. Learn to work with the people who deserve it, not the people who need it. Now, you've got to set up ahead of time who deserves it. When you, when you bring somebody into the enterprise, you just set it up. Say, when you do this, then we do this. And when you add this to it, then we step in here. When you do all this, then the company. Here's what we do after you've done all this. Make sure all those guidelines are clear when you set it up. Now then you know who deserves it. Somebody says, well, I've done this. And you say, fine. Okay, we'll step in. We'll do this. We'll give you the backup. 
you don't respond to need, you respond to who deserves. Now, remember, the pull is in the opposite direction. Guess who wants your help? Usually the wrong people. It's usually the people who need it, not the people who deserve it. But you must look, in an enterprise, you must learn to respond to the people who deserve, not the people who need. There's plenty of other places for your benevolence. You know, but in your enterprise, you respond to the people who deserve. The next key under leadership in working with a team of people is learn not to linger too long. Now you've got to have some patience, right, in working with people. You've got to give people time, but not forever. You can't linger too long. And that's another Bible story, right? Jesus got his disciples together one day and said, look, we're gonna go evangelize the world. We've been together three and a half years. It's now time to put the story on the people. And sure enough, the last 2,000 years, it's been a unique project, evangelizing the world. He said, here's how we're going to do it to start with. We're going to divide up two by two. You two take that city. You two take that city. Story said he divided them up two by two and sent them out to the various cities and said, go to the city, two of you tell the story. Then he said, if they buy the story fairly soon, stay. I guess, right? Put it all together, start the classes, get the church going, whatever. Get the synagogue rolling, whatever it was in those days. And, and build and grow. But he said, if you walk into a city and you tell the story and they don't respond fairly soon, he said, don't stay. Leave. Now, see, that's excellent leadership advice. Don't stay. And the reason is there's too many cities that will to linger long with those that won't. And you're not there to change anyone anyway. You're there to find people who respond to the story. That's who you're looking for, the people who respond. You're not there to wrestle them to the ground. So share and look. Share, look, and pick. And it's easy to pick, you pick the ones who respond. But he said, don't stay. Then he also added, when you walk out of one of those cities that doesn't respond, wipe your shoes off, right? Whatever that meant. I'm sure in those days that, no telling what that meant. There's some modern gestures that are easier to understand, but you know. But he did say, don't stay, don't linger too long. And the reason is because there's too many prospects. There's too many people who would be willing and happy for the story saying, I'm glad you came my way. I've been waiting for this story, right? There's so many like that, that you don't want to wrestle and worry and try to change people who are not going to respond. So that's good leadership information. Don't linger too long. Next is don't expect the pear tree to bear apples. Let everybody do what they can do. You can teach on apples and hang apples on a pear tree, try to get it started. You can put up signs that this is an apple tree. I mean, you can play all kinds of tricks. But sure enough, come season, you got pears. So let people do what they're gonna do. Find out what the response is. Find out where people can fit in your organization. Let them fit there. Let them grow to that position. Okay, let people become what they're going to become, be what they're going to be. But leadership learns the skill of selectivity rather than trying to remake people, because you can't make people become successful. Then one more point on building a successful team of people, two more. One is leadership should learn when you've got too many people for any one single enterprise. You've got too many that have lost touch, they've lost out, they've fallen behind. Just every once in a while you get to go through and, and rework your list and, and go through and see who still got the fire and the excitement and the joy and the vigor and the vitality. And then you've also got to analyze who have lost it. And that's just part of the process of building a good team. You just got to go through. 
You just got to take a fairly frequent look to see who you've got. Because sometimes you wind up with too many. And that's an Old Testament Bible story, right? Story of Gideon, the Jewish hero, military hero. Interesting story. Story says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon and said, you've been chosen to raise an army and chase off the Midianites. And the Israelites were having problem with the Midianites. I guess they were in God's doghouse for a while, right? He sent the Midianites along to, uh, you know, rough them up and push them around and give them all kinds of heartache and trouble. And, and the Midianites were good at it because they were mean and ugly. <laughs> they were bad news. But I guess finally they'd learned their lesson, right? And it was time for the Midianites to go. So the word was, Gideon, you raise the army, chase off the Midianites. Gideon said, no problem. Promptly became one of the world's all-time great recruiters. I don't know what all he did. Put up the little booth, join now, you know, whatever. <laughs> Clever advertising. But anyway, he got the job done. Within a short period of time, Gideon raised an army of 32,000. Short time. He is fairly proud of himself. Brings his 32,000 to the good Lord and said, I did as you commanded. I now have an army. We're ready for the Midianites. Good Lord says, good job, Gideon. You got to be one of the earth's noble. However, we got a problem. Gideon says, what is it? I'll fix it. The good Lord said, well, I appreciate your recruiting effort, but you got too many. Gideon says, wow, I don't understand that. The Midianites were mean. They were bad. You know, Gideon might have said, I wish I had about 10,000 more. And to take a look at the Midianites, he could have done with 10,000 more. But anyway, good Lord says, hey, take my word for it. You got too many. And Gideon says, well, what shall I do? The good Lord says, try this. Get them all together in one place. Stand up. Give your last ringing military speech. We're going to go conquer the Midianites. When you finish with your speech, say, if there's anybody here that's afraid we're going to lose the upcoming fight with the Midianites, you can be excused. No questions asked. Just go home. Can't use you. Gideon, <coughs> clever idea. Got them all together, gave his last ringing military speech, wound it up by saying, if there's anybody here that's afraid with the upcoming battle that we're going to lose, you can just quietly go home. We don't need you. And sure enough, some left that were afraid they were gonna lose. And the number was 22,000. <laughs> now, I don't, I don't know if they wrote pink slips or what they did, right? But Gideon says, how true. If you've got 32,000 and 22,000 think you're gonna lose, Guess what? You're going to lose. You can't use that many losers. <laughs> Gideon says, home. 22,000 go home. Gideon says, no problem. We'll do it with 10. And the good Lord said, you've still got too many. Gideon says, well, what now? The good Lord says, try this. March the 10,000 till they're hot and thirsty down by the river. And when you get to the river, the ones that just jump in, throw their spear down, throw their shield down, just jump in the water and start drinking. Said, you can't use them. They're too reckless. They're too careless. They're not vigilant. And you don't have time to train them. But the ones that keep the spear and the shield and just lap the water like a dog and keep looking around, those are the ones that are ready. And those are the troops you can use to fight the battle. Gideon said, how clever. Marches the 10,000 till they're hot and thirsty down with the river. And sure enough, some jumped in. They were careless. They threw down their spear, threw down their shield, jumped in the water, and started drinking. And the number was 9,700. 300 that were left. Got the spear and the shield. Right? Gideon says, you 9,700 home. So they go dripping home. <laughs> Gideon now has 300 out of 32,000 and says, no problem. However, we got to have a clever plan. <laughs> <laughs> so he puts together this incredibly clever plan. He says, what we will do, we'll use the element of surprise in the middle of the night. 
we will surround the camp and we'll space ourselves all around the camp of the Midianites. And Gideon says, when I give the word, we'll have a pitcher with a light in it. And we'll break that, show the light, and we'll each have a trumpet. And we'll blast on the trumpets, and then we'll scream and yell like Comanches. Or like something. <laughs> That's what he said. 300 say, no problem. Sure enough, they surrounded the camp, middle of the night. Midianites were asleep. Gideon gives the signal. They break the pitchers, show the light in the middle of the night, blast on these trumpets, and they scream and yell. The Midianites were asleep. They came awake hearing this incredible sound. It sounded like there were 300,000. They got so frightened and so confused, they started fighting each other. <laughs> Story says most of them went by their own sword. And the ones that were left are making it over the hill, 300, in hot pursuit. And Gideon becomes the great military hero. His story is preserved. And part of the lesson is, when you start an enterprise and you want to accomplish something, you've got to keep checking to make sure you haven't got too many. Too many that have lost the joy, they've lost the excitement, they've lost the vigor and the vitality and the feeling for success. And you just got to go through and find some little tests or something that will start showing you who you've got that's going to help you get the job. It's part of the challenge of leadership. Now here's one more. In building a successful team of people, leadership must understand the fact that there is both good and evil. When the leaders of our country, the founding fathers, put this country together, they considered the fact of both good and evil. They said, our real challenge is how to have just enough law to limit the bad side of our nature and how to have maximum liberty to encourage and entice the good side of our nature since we are both good and bad for whatever reason it is a fact there is both good and evil now here's what leadership must understand some people have given themselves over to the bad side they've sold out so you've just got to be careful as a leader it's part of the responsibility of leadership to guard the flock to guard the enterprise, to be watchful, be careful. Some people have sold out. Some people are troublemakers. You just got to learn to spot that. And some people are good producers, but they're troublemakers. And, but you can't afford their production. They will cause more misery than they will progress. It's part of the role of leadership. See, the real challenge of life is to be the least of the bad in us and the most of the good in us. But some people have just let the evil side of their nature overwhelm them and they've sold out. So leadership must understand there is both good and evil. You got to be on the lookout for those, even though they're talented, even though they might be have ability, you've just got to watch because you can't afford their presence. And that brings me to the story of the frog and the scorpion. According to the story of the frog and the scorpion, the story says the frog and the scorpion appeared on the bank of the river at the same time. And the frog was about to jump in the river, swim to the other side. The scorpion had to come along at the same time and observed what was happening. And um, when he saw the frog about ready to jump in the river, swim to the other side, he engaged the frog in conversation. He said, wait, Mr. Frog. I see you're about to jump in the river, swim to the other side. Mr. Frog said, that's correct. The scorpion said, look, I also want to get to the other side, but unfortunately I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. Would you be so kind as to let me hop on your back? You swim across the river, deposit me on the other side. I would be so grateful since I can't swim. The frog looked at the scorpion and said, no way. He said, you're a scorpion. And scorpions sting frogs. They kill them. He said, I'd get out there about halfway and you'd sting me and I'd drown. I'm not going to do that. You think I'm crazy? 
the scorpion said, hey, with your frog brain, you're not thinking. <laughs> he said, sure, I'm a scorpion, but if I was to sting you out there halfway, you would drown, but so would I. I can't swim. So I'm not going to do that. I want to get to the other side. Frog said, sounds reasonable, hop on. According to the story, the scorpion hops on the frog's back and the frog starts across the river. When he gets halfway, the scorpion stings the frog. They are now both in the water, about to go down for the third time. The frog cannot believe <laughs> what has happened. He says in his dying gasp, why did you do that? I'm about to drown, but so are you. Why would you do that? And the scorpion said, because I am a scorpion. You must understand, scorpions sting frogs. <laughs> and as a wise leader, you must not take any chances. So. Leadership should understand the story of the frog and the scorpion. And they must also understand the fact that there is both good and evil. Study these five subjects. First is be a student of possibility. Possibility. What's possible? The most incredible things are possible. And once you make the study, read the stories, look into it, you understand possibilities are everywhere. Doc Schuler's got the group called the Possibility Thinkers, right? I was a guest speaker for him one Sunday morning, a long time ago. The Possibility Thinkers, that's good. Be a Possibility Thinkers. Keep reading the stories, keep studying all of the possibilities, and keep looking for new possibilities in your own enterprise, with your own life, what's going on. Okay. Number one, be a student of possibility. Number two, be a student of opportunity. Opportunity in business, opportunity in the changing times, opportunity everywhere. Make sure you just take a look at all the opportunities in your own enterprise. Sometimes you don't have to go looking far for opportunity. It's right there. I know over the last half a dozen years, a lot of real estate people sold real estate, but they never bought any. Don't miss the opportunities. A man now has one home and two cars. What he really should have is one car and two homes. Make sure you don't miss the opportunities because a lot of them are right there, right there. Okay, don't pass up, but be a student of opportunity. Third, be a student of ability. Humans have the most incredible ability and be a student of your own ability. No telling what you could learn if you tried. No telling what skill you could develop if you tried. No telling what you could accomplish in your own ability. I've discovered some incredibly unique people that had the ability, and it just wasn't obvious to begin with. I found Harold Dyke up in Canada about 25, 23, 24 years ago. And we met socially, but I, I took a look right away and I said, here's a unique young man. He was 28 years old. He'd been working for the railroad in Canada for 10 years, started when he was 18, right out of high school. He was now 28 years old, been there 10 years, and he was making $325 a month, something about like that. And he was getting a bit discouraged. He said, I looked four desks over from me and there's a man 45 making six, $700 a month. And he said, you mean I'm gonna go from now till age 45, move three desks, and make six, seven hundred a month. He said, I was just getting a little discouraged with my prospects there. Well, anyway, I came along and I met him and I knew he had unusual ability. So I recruited him, hired him, he went to work for me. His first year with me, he made over $45,000. From a $325 clerk to 45000 his first year. Incredible. Now he's a very successful businessman incredible, unique gentleman. And the railroad had him for 10 years and never discovered his unusual abilities, right? 
So sometimes you've got people right around you. You've got to make sure you discover in the role of leadership, discover the people who've got the ability, and then make sure you discover your own ability. See, some things you just don't know till you try. You just don't know till you see if you can do it. So be a student of ability. Fourth, be a student of inevitability. That's important. Inevitability means on your present course, where will you most inevitably arrive? Learn all the inevitable stories. Sure enough, if you do it long enough. Sure enough, if you indulge long enough. Sure enough, if you neglect long enough. Sure enough, it's just predictable. It's inevitable. Inevitable. That's being 200 feet from Niagara Falls in a little boat with no motor and no oars. It's inevitable. In fact, it's over. <laughs> it's too late. When you can hear the roar of the falls and you're 200 feet, little boat, no motor, no oars, see, it's too late. Somebody should have painted you that picture way upstream and said, here's where you don't want to find yourself. And if somebody's skillful enough to paint the roar of the falls, to paint the scene of panic and desperation, and we all need these inevitable scenes painted for us. And as a leader, you need to get good at painting them yourself. For young people, older people, business people, in social affairs, whatever. Learn to paint the inevitable. Study the inevitable and learn to paint the inevitable. So that you can help people with the pictures of where surely their neglect will take them. Where surely their delay will take them. Where surely their current habits will take them. You just paint the pictures. Inevitable pictures. So be a student of inevitability. Here's the last one, and it's very important. Be a student of rationality. How to come to good conclusions from all that you've taken in. And that's a real challenge. Rationality. How should I proceed based on all I know? How shall I take all that I've gathered up and use it for the future? Making a rational conclusion based on input. Now, here's also the key to your future. Make sure the conclusions for your procedure are your own. Take input, yes, but not orders. Instructions, yes. Advice, yes. Information, yes. Somebody's opinion, yes. Orders, no. Make sure your Procedure is the product of your own conclusion. That's how you grow. And for leadership, you must really become skillful at coming to good personal conclusions based on all the input. Don't be afraid of advice. Don't be afraid of opinions. Don't be afraid of input. Take it all, but then come to your own conclusions. Hello there. It's great to see you again. So, what conclusions did you come to while listening to Jim? Did any of those challenges that he talked about seem familiar to you? Maybe you've encountered most, if not all of them, in your role as a leader. Based on what you've just learned, how do you think you've handled things so far? Moving in normal negative pull, or have you been allowing the wrong percentage of people to pull you down, away from your goals and achieving success? What about some of the leaders in your life, or boss, or manager, coaches, or mentors? How do they deal with these everyday leadership challenges? I would love to hear and learn what you took away from this massive amount of information Jim shared. Let me know how Jim's lessons will help alter your leadership style, or what hints and suggestions you have for being an effective leader. So go ahead and share your thoughts and experiences with others in the comments section below. And I look forward to seeing you in our next session. Awesome, awesome. That was so, so good. And we are, that was a long video. So I'm gonna go right to Tay. I took great notes and what I'll do is I will um, take pictures of my notes and put it in the page. So I want to go over here though and hear the takeaways, the top few things that uh, 
uh, Mr. Young heard. So how are you both doing this morning? I see Carrie's there too. Yeah, we're doing good, Chad. That was a uh, that was super awesome. We got both kids kind of got up early this morning, but that's fine. We handled it well. But uh, the thing that I took away the most was uh, <clears throat> when he said at the beginning, he gave us the three things: the best way to be build a team, uh, check your interest, uh, check your response, and check the results. <clears throat> I thought that was awesome because that's so measurable. Like you can just go to your social media and you can just check uh, these three things off. Like say you post a picture on your social media, like you know who's interested by the people who likes it. Like you can go and check your last three photos and you got that same person that's lacking your, your like last three opportunity posts, then you know they're interested in the opportunity. If you got that same person that's, you know, continually liking every picture that you post up about fat fighters, then you know like that person is interested in fat fighters. So I, I just thought that was awesome. Then check the response. Like, you know, if somebody is like hungry for change, then they're not going to sit back and just continue to like what you're putting out. Like, they're going to respond to your action calls that you're putting out. So I think that's a great way to, like, know, like, who's serious about growth or changing their lives and just making some extra income. And then check the results. Uh, this was probably my <clears throat> probably my favorite because, uh, man, I just think about so many people who reach out to you about one change, and then you provide the resources, and then you check back with that person, and they're still in that same situation. Then you ask them, hey, did you do this, what I told you to do? And they say, no, I haven't got around to that yet. Then it's like, okay, I, I know I'm not going to waste my time here because, like, I can't be more serious about your change than you are. So I thought that was just awesome. And I'll just uh, – one thing that I got from this, uh, we went to um, the Lincoln Boot Camp this weekend, and I just heard something that was – it was just so much. I got my little notebook. It was just so much great information. But some that just went along the lines with this, uh, then – when he said results must match the quality, I just thought about we had it was a presidential diamond from uh, New Jersey. I can't remember her last name, but I think her first name is Kim. She said, fall in love with people's activity activity, and not their potential. And then she said, the East suite doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dang, because I just thought for me, like, <clears throat> sometimes or well, most times I get so caught up and just one that's so bad for a person that I start to do things that's hindering them. Like, I start to really, because sometimes you can just want, you can be so in control of the situation and want things to go the way that you want that you kind of lose focus and just uh, forget to take a step back and just realize, like, this person has to want this for themselves. Like, if I continue to do things for them, then they're going to always come back to me for that. So for me, it was like, you know, that that's so true. Like, stop falling in love with what you think a person can be and fall in love with what that person is actually doing. And I think me and Carrie just have so many conversations about people who's been in our business for years. And, you know, they're still at that same level, you know, that they've been. And uh, uh, I think the thing that we had to come in terms with, uh, I think Jim Rohn, he talked about, you know, you got the 20, the 20 percent, the 40 percent, the 60 percent, and then you got the, the 100 percent. And he was like, some people are just going to be that 20 percent. And that's OK. Like, you can't try to force that person to become that 6 percent unless they want that for themselves. So for us, it was like take a step back and just understand the people who we're working with. But also take a step back and stop. Uh, trying to lead every situation and just sometimes you have to take a step back and just follow your leaders like let them show you like what what's the best areas of leading like what skills that, that do they have that can just maximize our, our team as a whole and I, uh, just a great example with that uh, uh, we have a rock star Ashley she's been showing up to these zooms like every Tuesday and Thursday and you know you look at her business like you can see it paying off but I think the best thing about that with me and Carrie uh this, uh, probably a couple months ago when we was pushing for that leadership retreat, we had the opportunity, like, we could have really forced our way and just do what we was doing in the past. We just basically do everything ourselves. And then we really had to take a step back and, like, hey, like you, we don't have to do this this time. We built the ambassador before. Like, you built the triple diamond twice. Like, you know how you did it in the past, and you know the results that you've gotten. So if you want those same results, then do it that same way. So we decided we didn't want those same results. We wanted leaders who wanted this more for themselves than we wanted it. So what we did was just take a step back and just let it rise. And Carrie will always say, like, she's a yellow personality. She's a <laughs> yellow personality. She, she just loved people so much. And the thing that we figured out when Carrie took a step back and she let her step into and start taking ownership of her business, like, Carrie was like, dang, this girl is red. And I was like, yes, like, you can't put a color personality on people. Like, you don't know what people are until you give themselves that, that opportunity to prove that they are this thing. So... I think just by us just taking a step back, let Ashley take control of her business, like we was able to not not just hinder her, but like we was able to allow her to like flourish in her leadership skills and just continue to grow while just continuing to give her the resources that she needs, which is 
this Zoom every Tuesday and Thursday just to continue to build her up, like, you, just to let her know, like, you're, you're just getting started. And I think for us, it's not just about her. It's about Shore and our team. Like, she's been in it for a while, and she was at this point in life, and she wasn't getting the results that she wanted, but she wanted change. And she stopped, like, not that she was just dependent on us, but we really got out of her way and we let her flourish into that leader that she needed to be. And because of that, she was able to show us things, show us another side of her that we didn't know she had because we were so busy trying to lead everybody instead of just follow some of my leaders. So I just thought that was so awesome. And I just love that quote that she said, the E-suite doesn't lie. Like, you have to stop waiting. Like he said, don't linger too long. You have to stop waiting on your best friend to wake up and decide that she wants this business. <laughs> like, your best friend is just a party girl who just want to have a lot of friends. Like, you have to leave her alone because ultimately, like, she's hindering you for where you want to go. And that's not a bad thing. It's just that some people are just going to be 20, and that's just how it is. Like, I'll just go back to what uh, Jim Rohn said. He said that that's just how it is. Like, you just have to understand that, and you have to move on, and you just have to continue to seek out those people who are hundreds. And the only way to do that is by continuing to build your business, continue to reach out to people, continue to ask people. Continue to post on social media and reach out to those people who just continue to show interest in that. So uh, I, I, I hope that was helpful for you guys. And I just love what uh, Kim said. I had to give her credit this first time. Next time I say this, I won't give her credit. So I had to make sure I, I learned that from Chad. Like, I, I give you credit the first time and the second time is mine. So that joke was so good. I thought I just had to share that with you guys and just uh, just realize, like, the E-Suite doesn't lie. If you got somebody who continue to come to you saying this business isn't working, this, this isn't doing, just go to the E-Suite print it off and go back to that person and say, well, uh, I hear what you're saying, but you're, what you're telling me isn't matching up to like the action that you're putting in. And it's not that you're like uh, down talking that person, it's that you're holding that person accountable. You're doing something for that person that probably nobody else is doing for them, which is being honest with them and just really calling them out on their BS. So I think if we can just continue to just really love each other enough to call each other out and just help each other rise, and I think ultimately our business will go exactly where we want it to go. So good, man. You, you made me think of one thing I'll share before we jump off here. So we're about 45 minutes right now. But um, I, I was taught one time that people are like apples. So and you've got red apples, green apples and rotten apples. So red apples are ready to go. You know, they're red. They're right. They're they're at the right time at the right place. Uh, green apples need time. Right. So sometimes I think we we uh, strong arm the green apples to join in the business and they're just not ready yet when we could just wait until they're ready and they come into the business and sometimes after a while when people are in the business they flip that switch like we have people who are in a year two years they flip the switch all of a sudden one day they go from being a green apple to a red apple they start rocking it out and then of course you have the rotten apples and there's not a whole lot you can do with rotten apples right you can't you can't eat them they're not going to ever turn red um, and then there's some of the people i think jim Rohn was talking about the the wolves in sheep's clothing so I love the red apples, the green apples, and the rotten apples. And, and the E-suite doesn't lie. I know Jim Rohn said something about fall in love with people's activity, not their potential. Mm -hmm. Because the graveyards of the world are filled with unused potential. And so that's great. We all have so much potential. But are we going to put in the work? You know, we're always, and all of you should be asking yourself, are you teachable? Are you willing to work? And do you have ambition? And once you get those things figured out, you'll start attracting people into your business that are willing to work and um, that, that are, do have a burning desire or they, do, they are ambitious and they are teachable. And that's ultimately what it takes to be a high level of success in this business. You have to, you have to become a very good student. And I know I'm preaching the choir because you guys wouldn't be on here if you wouldn't be very good students. So you got that figured out, you're teachable. Are you putting in the work? You've got to do the work and you can't just expect that, you know, you'll scratch off the winning lottery ticket and you'll find five people who are willing to do what you're not willing to do. Right. You got to lead by example and say, let's go do it. Not you go do it. Let's go do it. And so willing to work teachable. You got to have those ambitious goals. How Jim started this whole thing off is if you're going to put together a successful winning team, You've got to know where you're headed so that you know what it's going to take to get there. So whether that's Ruby for you, Diamond for you, Double Ambassador, you know, whatever it is, uh, it, can be, it can be done. I personally love the story of Gideon and how he started with 32,000 because sometimes I think we feel like we need this big, massive army. But there's Ambassador Diamonds in this company that just have very small volume making way more money than other people who have huge volume. So volume and people has very little to do with it. 
what has more to do with it is the quality of the people and the workers that you have in your, inside your team. So uh, don't worry so much about quantity, uh, worry about quality and make sure that you're providing an atmosphere where people can join your team and they can thrive under your leadership and just continue to grow yourself. And I'll see, we're gonna get into uh, the next module on Thursday, which is lifestyle. So I know it's Thanksgiving, but y'all, none of you guys are gonna eat Thanksgiving before like 8.30 anyway. So I'll be right here. I'll be in Illinois, but I'll be on here from Illinois. So I'll see you then. Everybody have a, a great few days and we'll talk to you on, on Thursday. Have a good one.